What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat. BDGE Fantasy Football. Thank you for joining me for another waiver wire episode. We we're talking about week four, the top waiver wire ads for this week of fantasy football. I want to say first and foremost, if y'all are 0-3, if any of you guys are 0-3, you are knocked out of the playoffs, guys. Playoffs usually don't start until week 15 into week 16. Sometimes you start week 14. But even then, you have 10 more games. You could win out 10 games in a row and get your first seed, get the first overall seed in the playoffs. Realistically, I've seen leagues where someone who is seven and six gets into the playoffs. You have plenty of time to turn your team around, make some trades, make the right waiver wire pickups, um, and turn this thing around. So 0-3, 0-4, you're absolutely not out of the playoff picture yet. So stay with us as we're gonna get you to the playoffs. I promise you that. Uh, we are getting into the waiver wire ads for week four. As always, they must be owned in 55 or less. 55% or less of Yahoo leagues. I'm not going to throw out the obvious names. And also, uh, as always, I filmed this video prior to Monday Night Football kicking off. So um, if there are players that kind of go off or there are players that, you know, perform well um, in that game, they're not going to be on this list because I didn't have analysis yet, depending on what their games, uh, what their previous week's games were, which would be tonight for them. Um, it is Pittsburgh versus Tampa Bay. Um, off the top of my head, a few guys that I know are available pretty widely are... One, on the Bucks side, it's Chris Godwin. Djax is finally owned in over 55% of leagues. Chris Godwin, I still don't understand. I think he's available in 41% of leagues. Um, he is someone that needs to be owned in every single league. I don't understand why he's still available. Uh, he scores a touchdown pretty much every single game. He has been scoring touchdowns in every single game that he's played like 50% of the snaps or more. He's getting wide receiver three type targets, and I expect that to continue as tonight will probably be a shootout. On the Pittsburgh side of things, I would say that I'm very intrigued by the tight end situation there because you have Jesse James and you have Vance McDonald. Now, heading into the season, McDonald was uh, the really hyped guy, right? He was one of my top three breakout tight end candidates for the year uh, because he's more athletic and he's a better receiver than Jesse James is. Jesse James has been the one that's been producing in terms of putting up stats and fantasy numbers because McDonald's been out. McDonald made his 2018 season debut last week. Um, he ran just five fewer snaps than Jesse James did. So him coming right off the injury and getting right, like thrown into the fire, I believe they had the exact same number of targets as well. Um, I think McDonald's kind of, McDonald kind of gets ramped up um, and, you know, it, and he's going to be used more in the passing game tonight. So if I had to choose between the two and both of them are available in more than 45% of Yahoo leagues, it would definitely be McDonald for me. Uh, that's something I'm keeping a close eye on tonight because like I said, McDonald was the guy that I would much rather have uh, earlier in the season because I believe his upside is much higher than Jesse James's, but Jesse James has had some monster games. Um, I think McDonald gets more incorporated into this offense, more incorporated into the passing game, and um, it should be interesting. So keep an eye on that matchup. Uh, depending on what happens, of course, I could totally see McDonald having like a pretty good game and then being one of the more popular waiver wire ads. And I wish I had kind of said this prior to, um, you know, the waiver wire being a thing this week, like prior to the weekend kicking off was like, um, Vance McDonald's a guy I'd rather hit on early, like be one week early than one week late in case he does have a big game because then, you know, with the tight end position really crumbling right now, he's a guy that I would like to add. But all that being said, let's move into the top waiver wire ads of this week. All right, so we're going to start off with the quarterbacks. We actually have a lot of quarterbacks on this one, uh, so a lot of streaming options. First off is Derek Carr of the Oakland Raiders, owned in 38% of Yahoo leagues. Um, and the orders of these players, there's always the percentage of them owned. It doesn't always mean that I, you know, I want Derek Carr over all the available quarterbacks. If you go to the blog post, I have a blog post version of all of my videos um, on BigDogsFantasy.com. You'll be able to see in text form, you know, my analysis, Yahoo ownership, their next three matchups, should you use a number one waiver wire on them, fab spend, all that stuff. So Derek Carr, 38% owned. And with the conclusion of week three, Carr currently sits fourth among quarterbacks in passing yards, depending on what happens with Big Ben, um, and third among quarterbacks in pass attempts with 111 attempts on the year, third in completion rate, 80.2%. He has not thrown for less than 288 yards in any of his three matchups. Garbage time or not, he's getting the volume and he's padding his stats enough to be a viable fantasy um, quarterback. He's missed Cooper on a few touchdowns. Uh, Cook was tackled on like the half yard line this week. So his numbers could and should be better going forward. 
And he's done this against the Rams. He's done it at Denver and at Miami. All three teams who um, have been stiff against the pass. Uh, they're eight and one combined. They're those three teams' record so far, and they have a combined nine to sixteen touchdown and interception ratio. So the fact that he's putting up these big stats against good pass defenses tell me that as the schedule kind of clears out, um, we should have better days for Carr. I know he hasn't looked amazing in like real life, real person quarterback ishness, but the stats are going to come. He'll face an underrated Cleveland defense, but he's playing at home. Uh, they travel to the Chargers after that, and the Chargers have. Although we thought they were going to be a defense to completely avoid from the passing side of things, they have not been. So it gets Cleveland at home at LA, and then they travel to, or no, no, they're home against Seattle in that third week. So I think there are plenty of um, good options to stream at quarterback, but Carr is definitely one of them. Would I use my waiver wire on my number one waiver? We'll put it this way I would never use my number one waiver wire on a quarterback unless I'm in a two quarterback league. I would spend between three and five dollars on Carr. Second quarterback on this list is Andy Dalton, Cincinnati Bengals. I'm really surprised. He's only owned in 33% of leagues. And a lot of this is probably dependent on, well, the amount of fab I would put down on him would depend on what A.J. Green's status is for week four and going forward. He uh, he suffered a groin injury. He, the team hasn't given updates. A.J. Green said he expects to be out there week four, but that doesn't really mean anything in my mind. All the players are always like... You know, they, they all think that they're coming back. Torn ACL, they think they're playing the next week, right? Darius Geis, i.e. So... Depending on Green's uh, status for week four, Dalton could be a great ad, but I still think he's going to be a good ad with or without Green. Because, you know, Green's obviously a difference maker in this lineup. But if Green's not in the lineup, Dalton still has a few proven weapons now. He's got Eifert, who's playing 65 to 70% of the snaps now. Tyler Boyd is emerging as a clear wide receiver, too. He's got two good pass catching running backs in Gio and Joe Mixon. We don't know what Gio, Joe Mixon's status is, but either way, Joe, uh, Gio Bernard can. Take most of the pass catching work from this backfield if uh, if Mixon is out again. So he's got some weapons outside of AJ Green, which is usually which hasn't been the case for the previous years. So Dalton currently sits at quarterback nine in fantasy football through three weeks of the season, and he gets a fantastic slate of games over the next five weeks. Now he travels to the dome in Atlanta, where the Falcons have just an absolutely fucking depleted defense. Right, they were without Deion Jones, they were without Keanu Neal, and now they just suffered another injury to. Ricardo Allen, who is a, a, a very underrated pass defender. Now, it's been back-to-back -back weeks that the Falcons have surrendered more than 335 passing yards and three touchdowns, three passing touchdowns to the opposing quarterbacks. Um, and like I said, you know, it's uh, it, their defense is just getting absolutely killed with these injuries. It's going to be a defense to attack in fantasy going forward. They travel to Atlanta in the Dome, right, which should be a high-scoring uh, high scoring game. Then they have Miami at home, which is probably their toughest matchup of the next five weeks. At Atlanta, Miami. Then they get Pittsburgh at home. They travel to Kansas City and then against Tampa Bay. All games you could take advantage of. So he's probably one of the better long-term plays on this list. So he could be a one-week streamer at Atlanta, but he's also a player that you could play in four of the next five games if you are streaming quarterbacks. I would spend probably between 5 and $8 on him. Third quarterback on the list, Case Keenum, Denver Broncos, owned in 25% of Yahoo leagues. He had a miserable week three, he threw for under 200 yards for the first time this season. Zero touchdowns, one interception, but um, I think that was probably to be expected, to, um, just given the environment, right? They played at Baltimore, which is a tough pass defense, of course. However, Keenum should bounce back, right? Week four, they travel to Arrowhead, um, and that puts him right back into streaming consideration, and I think he'll flirt with top 12 numbers considering they're playing the Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes. Now, KC has scored in their last three games, the first three games of the season, 38, 42, and 38 points. And they've also allowed 28, 37, and 27 points to their opponents in that span. And they are currently allowing the single most fantasy points allowed, or, or they are currently allowing the single most fantasy points to the quarterback position in fantasy football this year, depending on what happens in the Monday Night Football game tonight, that might change. But that's the sole reason I would play Keenum, because we've seen him have a ceiling of 300 plus yards, three passing touchdowns, and there's no better opponent to do it against than the Chiefs. The average quarterback so far against the Chiefs has totaled 386 total yards and three touchdowns. So he gets Kansas City, then he's at New York Jets, then home against the Rams. So you really only want him for this next week. Would I use uh, a lot of fab on him? Absolutely not. Probably between 2 and $3 because no one wants to touch him right now. But uh, he, he's a great streaming option for week four. Speaking of four, we'll move on to the fourth quarterback on the list, and that's Eli Manning of the New York Giants, owned in 18% of Yahoo leagues. Now, Sunday, you know, injected a bit of life back into the Giants' bloodstream. 
They had a 27 to 22 win over the Houston Texans. Um, and Eli Manning was 25 for 29, 86.2 completion percentage, 297 passing yards, two touchdowns. Some are going to say Eli's bike. He bike. Others will write it off that it was one good game, and we've seen enough of the sample size to know that he ain't bike. What I do know is that the Giants have a home game against the Saints in Week 4. Clearly, the Saints' pass defense is not elite or what we thought it was going to be in 2018. They just aren't that, right? They just let Matt Ryan throw for 374 yards and five touchdowns against them. So, in two of the three games so far this year, the Saints' defense has allowed an opposing quarterback to throw for 370 yards and at least four touchdowns, which is Ryan Fitzpatrick in Week 1, Matt Ryan last week, Week two was against Tyrod Taylor, so you don't expect those type of passing numbers, of course. The Giants also benched Eric Flowers yesterday, or on Sunday, um, yeah, which is, was yesterday, for the first time. In uh, it, you know, and that's a move that's probably two years overdue. I'm not sure how much that actually helped the line, considering J.J. Watt was credited with five quarterback hits and three sacks by himself. But um, it can't be a bad thing when you bench Eric Flowers, and it looked like their line was um, somewhat improved with the move there. So. Drew Brees is going to continue to do his thing on that side of the ball. Eli will be forced to throw a ton in this one. Um, it's a one-week pickup considering that they travel to Carolina after that, then they play the defending Super Bowl champs in the Eagles at home in Week 6. But Eli is definitely a Week 4 streamer if you uh, if you need someone to fill in for a week. And I'd spend like 2 to 3 maybe $4 on him. Numero 5, Joe Flacco of the Baltimore Ravens, owned in 14% of Yahoo League's I guess it's time for the fantasy community, for me, for you, for everyone out there, to start taking Joe Flacco seriously as a fantasy quarterback. I mean, all summer we heard he was ready to roll, um, and he's coming into the season with more motivation, and he's had just that, man, and he's looked pretty damn good. Now, Flacco is a top 12 fantasy quarterback through three weeks of the season, with very little volatility in his performance, and that's the big part here, because normally, like, Joe Flacco will randomly have big games and then go back to, like, 142 passing yards the week after that. With this new weapons group, right, they brought in, obviously, Crabtree, John Brown, Willie Sneed. They have a few new uh, tight ends, obviously, that are catching passes. This is shaping up to be a big fantasy year for Joe Flacco. Some might even say that he's elite. Now, I want you to look at this tweet that I put out about Joe Flacco yesterday. Um, and you can follow me at Nick underscore BDGE on Twitter. Joe Flacco's average depth of throw or average depth of target. Look at the last three years, 2015, 2016, 2017. 7.7. 7.8, 7.0. This year, I don't know why I put 2019, I fucked that up. But 2018, his average depth of throw was 9.3 through three games. So that is by far and away the highest he's had over the last four years. So he's throwing the ball downfield. His average depth of throw is much further. I know those don't like seem like significant numbers, but those are really, really big um, in terms of average depth of throw. So he's got the resurgence of John Brown, and he's got a real group of weapons around him, and he's starting to air the ball out. Now, that's something he has done pretty much zero of over the last three years. Through three weeks, Joe Flacco has attempted 16 deep passes per pro football focus, which is the fourth highest number in the NFL. He's completed six of them, so that's a 43.8 completion percentage for 180 yards, which is fourth in the NFL among deep passing yards. That puts him on pace for over 85 deep passes on the year. All of 2017, he had 47. So he's almost doubling the number of deep passes, and obviously that's going to lead to a lot more fantasy production. Now, Flacco has 889 passing yards and six passing touchdowns on 129 passing attempts through three weeks. Another tweet I had in this thread. Sometimes I just go off on certain players. Through three games, Joe Flacco is on pace to throw the ball 688 times for 4,741 yards and 32 passing touchdowns, all of which would be 11-year career highs for the elite Joe Flacco. When you think about it from an outside point of view, man, he's looking like he's going to be the favorite to be 2017 Alex Smith's 20 the you'll know what I'm saying Alex Smith's year last year is Joe Flacco's year this year right similar situation low average depth of throw quarterback they add weapons to the mix they get a group of weapons that's really good they drafted a backup quarterback just like they did with Alex Smith last year got a lot of extra motivation he's playing his ass off so is Joe Flacco um, so in week four Joe Flacco travels to Pittsburgh, where we know that offense and Big Ben play infinitely better when they are at home. They put up a lot of points, so it could be another high-scoring, high-volume passing game for Joe Flacco. Love him at Pittsburgh. Gets a little more difficult as they travel to Cleveland and then at Tennessee over the next two weeks. But for week uh, for week four, I definitely like him as a streaming option. And just considering what we've seen so far in those tweets that I've had, you know, uh, Joe Flacco is looking like he's going to be a much better fantasy option than most people kind of anticipated. So I would throw between five and eight bucks for him. He might be a long-term option for you. 
And the sixth and obviously most important man on this list is Baker Mayfield of the Cleveland Browns, owned in 11% of Yahoo leagues. I'm assuming that was at like 1% prior to this weekend, prior to Thursday. If you are in a two quarterback league, there is no question, no argument that he is the number one pickup on waiver wires. It's not even, a, I, don't at me, don't ask me if you should use your number one waiver on him. Don't ask me how much fab you spent on him. Get Baker Mayfield ASAP right now. He comes in and takes over for Tyrod Taylor. And I know I said Andy Dalton might be the best long-term pickup on this list, but it's it's Baker Mayfield. And I know you might think I'm going wild over one half sample size that we saw from Baker, but I really believe that everything we've seen from him in college, his accuracy, how, how much poise he has, and what we saw on Thursday night points to Baker Mayfield being an absolute superstar in this league. Um, and I'm sure he'll have his ups and downs as a rookie, but I'm almost positive that his year throughout the rest of the season is going to come with a multitude of QB1 performance, fantasy quarterback one performances uh, along the way. Now, he's not just a streaming option, in my opinion. I think he's someone that when he finds a groove and they get a nice uh, slate of matchups, he could become an every week fantasy starter by the end of the year. Um, listen, I know you might think I'm crazy here, but that's really how that's how strongly I believe Baker Mayfield is going to be the future of the Browns and, and a really big piece of the future of, of the NFL. So, you know, I might die on this hill. I don't know, but I think it's a good one to die on, and I'm more than happy to do so. Now, Baker travels to Oakland, so their week four matchup is at Oakland. Oakland is currently allowing the third highest yards per attempt to opposing quarterbacks. Um, they have allowed a 6-1 to one interception, touchdown to interception ratio. They just allowed 289 passing yards and three scores to Ryan Tannehill. Um, admittedly, a lot of those were almost like dump-offs or carries, but still the stats were there nonetheless. I don't think Oakland is a team to be feared in the passing defense. Um, I believe they have three sacks on the year, which is literally the fewest in the entire NFL. Baker Mayfield in a clean pocket with time not being pressured is a scary quarterback. NFL, college, doesn't matter. Um, so they get at Oakland, then they're home against Baltimore, and then home against LA Chargers, which could be difficult matchups. Um, so what I use the number one waiver wire on him. In two quarterback leagues, of course, yes, immediately. In, um, and in deeper leagues, too. If you're in like a 16 or 18 team and you're desperate for a quarterback, Baker Mayfield could be your option going forward. In a one quarterback league and like 14 teams or shallower, no, I would not use it on him just because the quarterback position is obviously replaceable. But he's got good weapons, man. Um, would have loved to see Josh Gordon stay here, but it is what it is. I really, really like Baker Mayfield going forward. I would use probably between eight and twelve dollars in regular leagues, and if he's in, uh, if he's available in your two quarterback league, then I'm, I'm throwing a, a fork load of money, whatever that means to you guys. And I always talk about this in terms of fab spend. Like when you guys ask me, oh, how much, what percentage, or how much should I spend in fab? I can't give you a number there. Who you are picking up in terms of like what you should spend on their fab is infinitely less important than knowing your league and knowing how aggressive players are. Because I have leagues where, like when uh, Joe Mixon got hurt, right, I wanted to get Geo, and he was available in a lot of my leagues. One league, I spend uh, $31 on him in fab, and the next highest bid was like $8. In another league, I'd spend like $27, and someone bid like $40. So it's all about knowing your league, knowing um, you know how, how desperate are you at the position, knowing your roster, right? So it's so difficult for me to just give you a number because it does not it's not one size fit all. So just keep that in mind. Knowing your league and knowing the aggressiveness of fab budgets is infinitely more important than the actual player that you're picking up. And we are going to move on to the running back position. And this is a this is not a good week for waiver wire running backs. If you don't have running backs to start in week four, this is not going to be a week where you use your your waiver wire on a running back and you know it's not a plug and play kind of week. Um, all the handcuffs that could have been played last week, Latavius Murray, Corey Clement, um, TJ Yeldon, Gio Bernard are all highly owned now, and uh, a lot of their the starters behind them are probably coming back either this week or the week after that. So everyone that was so excited about, oh, I went 0RB, and now I have a bunch of starters, like, no, you don't, because they all kind of suck this week anyways, except for Gio. But I also want to say, as a, as a creator, I spent a lot of time doing these videos, so one, I would very, very much appreciate it if you gave the video a thumbs up. So if you'd mind just scrolling down a little bit and giving the thumbs up button, that would be awesome. Two, uh, if you want an early access to this video or this this blog post, you can get that via patreon.com slash bdge. That is like where you support creators because we put a lot of time into it and we spend a lot of money on like equipment and microphones and cameras and shit like that. So it's a way for you to kind of 
uh, give back and support your favorite creators. So patreon.com slash BDGE, you can get early access to things, you get guaranteed question and answers. Now my social medias have been blowing up this season because obviously my audience has been growing rapidly, so I don't get around to a lot of the questions I get on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, whatever. On Patreon, I answer every single question that is asked of me, trade, sit start all those things as well as my weekly rankings which is something i've never done before but i just started doing it to my patreons or patrons as they call it so if you want any of that like premium access with me along with a live stream that i do every wednesday night a private live stream only for my patrons where i really actually answer football questions and stuff we talk for like an hour straight it's good um you can check me out there patreon.com slash bdge running backs there is suck allen over at baltimore <sighs> He is owned in 35% of leagues. I'm getting sick and tired of putting him on this list, to be honest with you. Clearly, he is a huge part of this um, Ravens offense, and I've been saying the same thing week over week over week. He should be owned in way more than 35% of leagues. He is the RB15 in standard leagues, RB11 in PPR leagues right now. Now, Collins has outcarried him um, pretty heavily, 34 to 16 this year, but Allen has doubled Collins' target total, 16 to 8. I'm not going to get into how... Alex Collins has a higher catch percentage or nearly double his yards per target and yards per reception number on Allen, but but I'm not going to get into that. That's all I'm saying. So all that matters is the Ravens are going to use him. Allen has three times the number of goal line carries that Collins has. It's six to two right now. Buck Allen has been playing on 82% of the goal line snaps for the Ravens. And Collins has been on uh, been in on just 27% of them. So Week three was the first time Buck outsnapped Collins too, uh, and now has a 111 to 104 snap count advantage on the year. So this is clearly a running back by committee, and they're going to use Allen in the passing game and on the goal line, which are obviously very valuable touches. Um, David Johnson has just 12 more total snaps on the year than Buck Allen, who is in a committee. So just let that be known. Buck Allen, they travel to Pittsburgh, at Cleveland, and at Tennessee. As I talked about with Flacco, it could be a high-scoring game. They could use Buck Allen a lot in the passing game. If you're in a PPR league and you need running backs, I would throw somewhere from 10 to $15, and I would think about uh, using my number one waiver wire if your RB2 is like Derrick Henry and you have nothing behind that. So Buck's a good pickup. Marlon Mack is the other pickup this week for the, uh, the Indianapolis Colts. 35% owned. Now, what I will say Mack has going for him, I mean, what, what is very nerve-wracking is, one, I will just say don't use your number one waiver wire on him. I've been getting that question. Um... Now, he was a starter, of course, before the injury, but it's now concerning that he's dealing with a foot and hamstring injury after missing almost all of summer with a hamstring injury, right? And now he's dealing with that again. He was a scratch from week three. We don't know if he's going to be healthy for week four. Um, the one thing he does have going for him is the fact that Jordan Wilkins, I mean, he's been good. He's been okay, but he hasn't been great. And in order for Jordan Wilkins to run away from this committee, he would have had to have been great for the first three weeks of the season. That didn't happen, so as soon as Marlon Mack is back, Mac is back. He's going to get a ton of opportunity still and have a chance to kind of run away with the job. What I will say even lowers his ceiling more is the fact that like that whole the whole theory behind wanting the running back in Indianapolis was like, oh, you're getting the running back in an Andrew Luck led offense. They're not like the Andrew Luck of 2014 led offense anymore. So it's not like you need the running back who is going to be the starter there. You know what I mean? So uh, Mac, I'm not going crazy about, but he is probably the only other running back that is owned in less than 55 percent of leagues that is worth probably um, picking up this week. So, a speculative ad, depending on his injury status, of course. So we'll move on to the wide receivers. And this is a good week for wide receiver pickups. As I mentioned, depending on what happens in Monday Night Football, Chris Godwin is a great pickup, only owned in 41% of Yahoo leagues. First up on the list, we got to go with Calvin Ridley, of course, my boy, out in Atlanta, 44% owned in Yahoo, um, the wide receiver one in Atlanta. I'm just kidding. I'll put some respect on Julio's name, of course. He had his coming out party this this uh, on this Sunday. He was the first round pick of uh, of the Falcons. Of course, he went fucking nuts. He caught seven of eight targets for 146 yards, three touchdowns. Those three touchdowns tied the same number of touchdowns Julio had all of last year. So after an embarrassing week one, you know it looks like Atlanta has kind of fixed some of their red zone woes, and it looks like it doesn't include uh, forcing the ball to Julio Jones anymore. Julio Jones on the year has seen the same number of red zone targets as Calvin Ridley does, and I think most of those were in the first game against the Eagles. But Julio has not caught a single pass down there in the red zone. Ridley has turned two of his three red zone targets into touchdowns, um, and he now has four touchdowns over the last two weeks. And this red-hot offense is not slowing down anytime soon given the, the state of their defense, right? This is going to be a defense where the opposing offenses score a ton of points, and they're going to have to battle back, and Matt Ryan's going to have to take a lot of deep shots, and that's great for Calvin Ridley as he gets, you know, um, 
the number two cornerback on most teams. So obviously having Julio means that a lot of safeties have to play over to him and they have their opposing cornerback one on Julio, giving Calvin Ridley, who's a great route runner, you know, um, the space to just operate. All he has to do is beat that one guy, the cornerback two on the team. That's not going to be a problem for Ridley going forward. So he's going to be a major asset to this offense. The great, actually, I mean, you could take this as a great thing or a bad thing, but the uh, what I think is a good thing is that there's plenty of room to grow. Calvin Ridley is only playing on 61% of Atlanta's offensive snaps right now, and that's what he did in week three. He didn't play. He's not a full-time starter yet. Mohamed Sanu is still playing on way more snaps than him. Julio's an 81% player for some reason, and Sanu is 79% player. Um, he played on 79% of the snaps for the Falcons so far this year. Calvin Ridley only 61%. So there is room to grow. And someone playing 60% of the snaps, scoring three touchdowns, catching eight, seven, eight passes, there is a lot of upside there. Um, a lot more can be made of you know his performances. So if the rookie keeps up anything close to these types of performances, they'll have no chance but to start him over. Sanu and two wide receiver sets. They play Cincinnati at home. Then they play at Pittsburgh and home against Tampa Bay. Three great uh, matchups in a row. Would I use my number one waiver on, wire on him? Yes, if I am I'm a wide receiver needy team. I would spend, pro I'm not gonna go nuts on the waiver wire though, guys. Um, I would probably spend between like 12 and $18 on Ridley, and that is probably the highest number. Uh, the other, another two guys that I'm not gonna, I don't wanna get too, too into because they're on this list every single year. I mean, every single week is Ted Ginn of the Saints, still the wide receiver two there. Again, double-digit fantasy points in two out of three games. He will continue to play a role in this Saints offense that um, is going to be in score, shoot and score mode a lot of the time because their defense is not that good. Jeronimo Allison, the clear wide receiver three. If not the wide receiver two at this point, he is catching a ton of his passes. His average depth of target is 13.4, which is way higher than Adams' 8.4 and Cobb's 6.4. So he is clearly the deep target, the deep favorite target of Aaron Rodgers, and he's catching a lot of these passes, which means Rodgers is going to trust him more and more and more, giving him more looks. The Packers actually go on a pretty nice schedule right now for passing defenses. They play at home against Buffalo, then they're at Detroit, and then San Francisco at home. So uh, I could see Aaron Rodgers getting really hot, and obviously that plays to the part of all of the Green Bay Packers wide receivers. Um, so I would spend between 12, 10 and $12 if I need a wide receiver, maybe upwards of 15 to 18 if, I, if I'm really desperate. So I like Ron Allison. Um, the fourth guy on this list, Cleveland Browns, Antonio Callaway, the rookie. Fourth round rookie with first round talent, owning 33% of Yahoo leagues. Now with Baker coming off the bench, this entire offense gets a major upgrade. Callaway, Jarvis Landry, Carlos Hyde, all these guys. The best part about Callaway is he's probably left nearly 150 receiving yards and maybe two to three touchdowns on the field so far. Some of that is from, the, the, the majority of it is from under throws on, uh, on Tyrod Taylor's part. If you're watching some of these these throws, right, Callaway burns his guy. Callaway is open, deep. Tyrod just doesn't ha have the strength. He did leave one on the field when it came to Baker Mayfield. Um, he dropped a beautiful ball right into the basket of Antonio Callaway deep down the left side. And Callaway just, um, he just dropped it. But Callaway does have... 14 targets over the last two weeks with an insane 18.6 average depth of target, which is sixth highest over the last two weeks among all NFL wide receivers that qualify. So Callaway is being used heavily. He's being used on deep passes, right? And they don't really have another deep option on that team with Gordon gone and Baker Mayfield is extremely accurate. So that's an upgrade for Antonio Callaway, of, of course. Also over the last two weeks, Callaway owns a 38% air yard share of the Browns's Air yards um, per airyards.com and a 21% target market share, which is gorgeous, of course. So Jarvis Landry gave him his 28 to 33% targets. If Callaway is getting 21% of them. He could easily finish the year as a wide receiver three in fantasy. They play at Oakland, Baltimore at home, LA charges at home. Would I use the number one waiver wire on him? If the other wide receivers go off the board um, and you are a wide receiver needy team, yeah, I think I would actually. I think he has a lot of upside. I would spend between 12 and 15 bucks on him probably. Uh, and that would be the fourth wide receiver on this list, number five. Before we get into number five, I want to thank today's sponsors for the video. As you all know, it's FantasyJocks.com. They are the industry leader in equipment for your fantasy leagues, whether it is championship belts, whether it is rings, whether it is trophies, whether it is live draft boards. If you play baseball, if you play basketball, they got all that stuff too. If you use promo code TAKE10 or Taco Corp, you'll get 10% off your order. Um, I know the season's not over yet, but y'all, y'all should anoint your champion with a piece of gorgeous equipment. And these are very high quality. You can get your team's name engraved on the side of it. So you can have a list of your previous champions, have everyone chip in five, eight, 10 bucks. And 
you'll be able to afford either a trophy. They got cool Lombardi trophies. They just came out with a version 4 ring, which is pretty gorgeous. In my opinion, uh, head over to fantasyjocks.com. It will be linked below and grab your league some gear. Move on to wide receiver number five on this list, and that is Tyler Boyd of the Cincinnati Bengals, owned in 16% of Yahoo leagues. Again, we don't know the extent of A.J. Green's injury, but we do know Tyler Boyd is the clear wide receiver too here in Cincinnati. Um, and in week three, he had another breakout game where he went six of seven, caught six of seven targets for 132 yards and a touchdown. Now, I know a lot of people are going to be like, oh, well, that was with A.J. Green off the field. Well, he was like four for 46 at halftime with A.J. Green on the field. A.J. Green got hurt later in the game, and then he exploded, of course. But he was doing well with A.J. Green on the field. And this is an offense that's bouncing back. He is a top 12 fantasy receiver now in back-to-back -back weeks. So um, he's been far out snapping John Ross. And he's, like I said, he's a clear-cut wide receiver, too, in Cincinnati. Um, he's run over 69% of his routes from the slot in 2018, which is good news if Green misses time because John Ross will take his place and probably line up against the opposing cornerback one. So uh, they get a great slate of pass defenses over the next five weeks. So if Green misses this week or extended time, they're playing at Atlanta. Again, shootout mode. Miami at home. Pittsburgh at home. At Kansas City. Tampa Bay at home. So would I use a number one waiver on, wire on him? No, because I just feel like Boyd as a slot receiver is a guy whose you know, upside is kind of naturally lower than some other guys because he's not like the greatest athlete or anything. He finds a way to, he's like very good in zone zone spots. So he's kind of like a Cooper Cup, um, which is which is, could be fine because slot receivers kind of seem like the future of the NFL. And in terms of fantasy production, I'd spend between eight and $10 on him. So like Tyler Boyd a lot, of course, and uh, like him more if AJ Green misses time. And we'll move on to the last wide receiver. Now, hear me out. Devonta Parker of the Miami Dolphins, owned in 30% of leagues. I know it's a very messy situation there, right? They have Jakeem Grant, Danny Amendola, Albert Wilson, and Kenny Stills. But Wilson, Amendola, Jakeem Grant are all playing like nine snaps a game. Devonta Parker, right, made his 2018 debut in week three. He caught two of three targets for 40 yards. He immediately became a near full-time player. He saw the field for 75% of the team's snaps, and that number should only increase going forward. The three targets obviously weren't great, but what was promising was his average depth of target at 23 yards. Now, he may never develop into that prototype wide receiver one that most people had hoped for, but he will tape away, take away deep looks from Stills, and if he is the deep threat here and looked at as a possession receiver, he is definitely going to have his share of... of of big games here. And I think that average depth of, of target, you know, being very deep down the field is obviously a good thing for Devontae Parker. So him being healthy, him playing on 75% of the team snaps tell me that he is, uh, his future is somewhat bright here. So he's definitely not someone I'm going nuts about. I'd probably only spend like three to five dollars on him, maybe if I'm in a wide receiver needy spot, but he's someone who has uh, down, down the length of the season, some upside there. So those are the wide receivers. We'll move on to the tight end. As I mentioned before, keep an eye on the Steelers tight ends. I'm, I have a feeling one, if not both of them, are going to end up back on this um, this list next week. One I'd be targeting would probably be Vance McDonald's because I think he's a better athlete and better pass catcher. He'll probably work his way into more snaps as the season progresses. But um, we have another injury to the tight end position. It's Evan Ingram. He is supposed to be week to week, which is never good. They ruled him out immediately when he came off the sideline, which is not a good thing. Um, so... I'm almost assuming he's going to miss this week, and I would probably almost put it at uh, a two-week absence, if not more. You know, we have to wait on MRIs, I guess. Um, so, you know, just another hit to the tight end position. But, 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 someone came onto the wire that should not be this openly available, and that's Jack Doyle of the Indianapolis Colts, owned in 53% of Yahoo League. So, technically, he makes the cut here. I don't know how y'all are letting this happen. I don't know why he's on the, the wire. I wish he was on the wire in some of my leagues, but... If I'm in a league where I'm hurting at tight end and I'm streaming and Doyle is available, I am shedding out a pretty pretty gorgeous penny for this band. And I know the production has not been there yet, especially from the, the touchdown side of things um, when you compare him to Eric Ebron. But in my mind, Doyle is very, very much still the tight end to own in, uh, in Indianapolis when he's active and he is healthy. Prior to week three, Doyle led the team, not just tight ends, but the entire Colts offense in snaps. He outsnapped Ebron 136 to 53 in that span, and Doyle had an 18% target market share over the first two weeks, which was sixth among all NFL tight ends. So the opportunity is there and is going to continue to be there as long as he's healthy. 
With Doyle out for week three, Ebron was in a spot to blow up, but he managed to catch just five of 11 targets for 33 yards. But <clears throat> those 11 targets is just another testament to how much Luck loves targeting the tight end position. Um, and considering he wasn't the guy throwing, right? Joe Kobe Brissett came into the last play of the game for, for Andrew Luck because the Colts had to throw a Hail Mary like 65 yards down the field. And I'm not going to make a big deal out of this because Andrew Lux looked fine throwing the ball down the field. Obviously, they don't. What, what's the point of chucking that down the field 65 yards if he can't make it? Um, they're playing cautious with him. What that tells you, though, is obviously his arm is not at completely full strength and he can't make those deep throws. So he will continue to be a dink and dunk quarterback as he's been throughout the first few weeks of the season, which means the tight ends, especially Jack Doyle, is going to continue to be peppered with targets. All those underneath throws that have been happening are not going to stop anytime soon. And including, uh, you know, like the thing is like the, the usage for Doyle and Ebron is not even close. I know Ebron is overshadowing him because of the touchdowns, but if you include week three, right, the, including the week that Doyle sat out and Ebron was actually the only tight end there, Doyle has run 81 passing routes in 2018. Eric Ebron has run just 34. So in a week where he was the primary tight end there, he has ran a total of 34 passing routes on the entire season. So Doyle is clearly the pass-catching tight end in an offense that loves to throw to the tight end. So assuming Doyle is healthy, he's in a great spot to break out in week four. He goes against Houston at home, and I think Andrew Luck's going to have a pretty big uh, pretty big game. I think it's going to be a high-scoring game. Houston got killed by Gronk in Week 1, and they just allowed a 3-for-39 and one touchdown game to the Giants' back end, uh, the Giants' backup tight end in Rhett Ellison, the god. So if Evan Ingram is out, Rhett Ellison is not a guy you want to keep your eye on. Uh, so you get Houston, then they're at New York. I mean, they're at New England, and then at New York Jets. So, uh, dude, I love... I love Jack Doyle, it, would I use the number one waiver wire on him? Yes, if I'm someone who lost Walker, Greg Olson. I don't know if I'd use it on Ingram because he'll probably be back in a couple weeks, but he's someone that I'm, I'm spending 15 to 20, 25, 30 if you really need him, but I, I'm really still high on Jack Doyle. The other guy I'm high on this week that I'm surprised is owned in this, uh, available in this many leagues after this week is Tyler Eifert of the Cincinnati Bengals, owned in half of leagues. Unowned in half of leagues, owned in half of leagues. He's still far from an every down player, but I don't think we're ever going to get to that point. But he is playing in 65% of the team's snaps. Uh, and that was the number that he played in in week three. And that was actually the highest number of the season so far for Eifert. So expect those kind of numbers and maybe even an increase moving forward. And it was also by far and away his best fantasy game, right? Caught six of eight targets, 474 for uh, receiving yards. Now, Eifert is another bangle that will obviously benefit if A.J. Green misses time. Now, again, I have no idea if A.J. Green is going to miss time. He said he's okay, but... Think about the groin. The groin is a very sensitive area, right? Every move you make, your lower body is through the groin area. You know what I mean? So very high risk of re-injuring something or causing an injury to another part of the, the leg if not rested properly. So if he's out, Eifert should be a great streamer in week uh, four. And they literally get five matchups in a row in which the tight end is in a good, uh, is in a good matchup. They get... They're at Atlanta, Miami, Pittsburgh, at Kansas City, Tampa Bay. Again, Miami is the only pass defense that's been good so far, but they are not good against opposing tight ends. That is like one weak spot. Um, now, again, if Green misses week four, Eifert could be a top 12, if not top 10 option for sure. They play the Falcons, um, who is without their top coverage linebacker and Deion Jones, and safety Count O'Neill. So fire him up. I would spend between 7 and $10 if I need a tight end. Um, again, I'm not going to talk about Ben Watson because he's been on this list forever. He had another big game. Not another big game, but he had a good game, five for seventy-one, which is definitely uh, you know fill-in worthy. He hasn't caught a touchdown yet, but he should have had one in week two. Um, he has fifteen targets on the year, which is tied for eleventh amongst NFL tight ends. His eighty-six percent catch rate is second among all tight ends that have double-digit targets. Um, gets a good matchup against the Giants or at New York before he plays Washington. So he's someone that you could throw in your lineup if you are desperate, of course. Ricky Seals Jones. Um, of the Arizona Cardinals is another tight end I'm keeping my eye on. He's owned in just 22% of leagues, right? He was a guy that a lot of people expected to break out given his preseason usage and his athleticism that he displayed last year, but his offense has been fucking terrible. And he's strictly on this list because Josh Rosen gives this offense hope, and I'm expecting him to be announced the starter. 
He might have already been announced a starter, but Ricky Seals Jones has a 17% target share on his team through the three weeks of the season so far, which is seventh among NFL tight ends. He's caught just eight of 15 targets on the year, um, but he has zero drops. So it was either bad throws or good defense that held him down. I'm going to probably say it was bad throws, but, um, you know, I tried looking back at Josh Rosen's numbers from 2017 to see like how heavily he involved the tight end in his, you know, in his passing game. They don't really count targets in college, or at least I don't know of a website that really does. So it's kind of difficult to get those numbers. But what I did find was that their tight end, Stan, um, UCLA's tight end last year, Caleb Wilson, is extremely highly rated per Pro Football Focus. He only played in UCLA's first five games of 2017 with Josh Rosen before like a foot injury made him miss the rest of the year. But in those first five games, right, just five games, Caleb Wilson caught 38 passes for 490 yards. So in five games, 490 yards, 38 passes. That's over seven catches a game. So maybe it was Caleb Wilson being really good, or maybe it was that Josh Rosen loves the tight end. But it can't get much worse than Bradford, uh, the situation in Arizona. So Ricky Seals Jones is a guy maybe to stash and hope that the connection between those two are real. Um, so I'm looking forward to see what he does under center there. The I believe it's the last tight end on this list is um, y'all are not going to like this one, but Mark Andrews of the Baltimore Ravens, their rookie tight end, one uh, percent owned. It was kind of an absurd draft for the Ravens. They drafted Hayden Hurst in the first round. Then they drafted Mark Andrews, their third round pick out of Oklahoma. You have Hayden Hurst, who's 25 years old. He has yet to resume practicing after undergoing a foot procedure back in August. So he's expected to miss a little more time. I have no idea how long he's going to be out for, but clearly he's not ready to go. Um, and this hasn't, this has opened the door. This is, you know, given the opportunity to like all the other 15 tight ends that are on the Baltimore Ravens depth chart right now. The production overall has been pretty even between Mark Andrews, Nick Boyle, Max Williams up to this point, but Andrews is starting to pull away in the receiving statistical aspect of the game. He now leads the Baltimore tight ends in targets, receptions, yards, and touchdowns on the young season. For those of you that don't know much about this rookie, this is the blurb from Roto World, what they wrote about Andrews after being drafted. Andrews is 6'5", 256 pounds. He made 26 starts in three seasons as a Sooner, breaking Oklahoma's all-time record for yards by a tight end, 1,765, and averaging a wide out like 15.8 yards per catch with 22 touchdowns. In 2017, PFF College started Andrews with the second most yards per route run, which PFF always touts as a predictive statistic, and the most y yards, the most yards among all D1 tight ends on both 20-plus yard targets and slot routes. Y'all can read the rest, but pretty much they're saying Mark Andrews is a receiving tight end, and that's about it. Baker Mayfield made so much money off of Mark Andrews last year that, you know, it can't really be ignored. Um, and Andrews is actually being outsnapped by both of the other Baltimore tight ends so far. But Andrews has run the most routes out of all three, which is significant, meaning they're using him in the passing game a lot more than the other three. He has 55 routes run, Boyle has 45, Max Williams has 33. So he's more of a stash and hope. Um, but given his, uh, his college pedigree and his usage in the past game so far with the Ravens, I think Andrews has easily the highest ceiling in terms of fantasy tight ends in this offense. And I, I would like to stash him if I'm in a deeper league and kind of see what happens. And we'll move on to defensive and special teams. Now, I've been pretty money with my streams so far, and last week was no different. My top three streams were the Carolina Panthers, Cleveland Browns, and Miami, who finish as defensive uh, fantasy defense number seven, eight, and ten. And uh, I look to do that again in this week. And there are, um, there's pretty much one defense that I really want this week that is owned in 55% or less of Yahoo leagues. That's the Green Bay Packers versus the Buffalo Bills. They're owned in 29% of Yahoo leagues. Like I always say, guys, if you're looking for a streamer, a, de a defense that is streamer, three criteria. You want the team that's favored. You want a team that's favored to win the game. Always. You don't want to take an underdog. Two, you want a team that's playing at home. And three, you want a team playing in a low over-under total. Those are three criteria, probably in order of importance. And fourth, if you need a tiebreaker, it's obviously you want to pick uh, a defense that's actually good in real life. So, the over-under in this game is 45, which is about average, mediocre. Um, but Green Bay is minus 10. They are 10-point favorites in this one. They are at home against the Bills. I don't really need to explain this to you, I don't think. Green Bay plays very, very good when they are at home. Their defense has been great at Lambeau. Um... They scored 11 fantasy points in week two against Minnesota at home, and now they are home against Buffalo in week four. They also play San Fran at home in two weeks, which um, obviously they, they don't have Jimmy G any longer, so you can roster them for 
both games, right? Buffalo at home, San Francisco at home in week six. They do travel to Detroit in week five, so I probably wouldn't be playing them, but in two of the next three matchups, you could feel pretty good playing the Packers. Now, I also want to add this section to the kind of the end of the video because obviously, you know, when you give out waiver wire questions, you, you, you need to add someone, but you also need to drop someone. So these are a couple guys that I think are absolutely droppable right now in, you know, standard one quarterback, um, you know, leagues that are 14 teams or less. Dak Prescott, Marcus Mariota, Mitchell Trubisky at the quarterback spot. Uh, running backs, Theo Riddick, Tariq Cohen, Rashad Penny, Duke Johnson, Nick Chubb, Ronald Jones. I don't know why any of those guys would be on your roster, but you can drop them safely. Alfred Morris is another guy who the value is obviously going to take a monster hit with the loss of Jimmy G. Um, right now, Matt Breida is actually questionable for this week's game, I believe. So I'd hold on to Morris right now. I wouldn't drop him yet. And some guys I would, you know, I'd prefer to hang on to, but really if you're in like a 10-team league, or smaller and you need to drop players. Derrick Henry is a guy that, you know, I think people are going to hold on to for way too long. He has yet to score six fantasy points in a game in a half point PPR league. Um, Jamal Williams is a guy you could drop as well because now that Aaron Jones is back, you know, Jamal Williams had one chance to be the guy this year and be a really good fantasy running back and it was to break out in the first two weeks. He hasn't done that. Aaron Jones is back. There's no shot that Jamal Williams comes close to the ceiling that he once had. Um, so he would be fine dropping and then depending on what happens tonight in tonight's game Peyton Barber is a guy who's getting a lot of volume but he's just not getting anything done he's not producing any fantasy points so um it's only a matter of time if he can't be efficient with the ball before they start you know working Jaquiz Rogers more into uh the timeshare or um even activating Ronald Jones and seeing what the rookie could do so Peyton Barber is not he's a guy I'd rather hold on to just because he's getting the volume but obviously he's not someone that you feel comfortable starting in your lineup Wide receivers, Pierre Garçon. I don't know why, again, he would be on your team. Told you all not to even draft that mother. Dante Pettis, the other San Francisco wide receiver. Um, Robbie Anderson at this point I would drop. DJ Moore, Rashard Matthews, Josh Doxson, Philip Dorsett, Michael Gallup. All guys very droppable. So those are some names out there that you might have been holding on to that I'd be comfortable dropping. That's going to wrap up this week's waiver wire. If you enjoyed, please give it that thumbs up, man. That's how other people find my channel. That's how I grow. It's how your mans feeds his children. You know what I mean? Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We do waiver wire videos every Tuesday. We do Q&A videos every Thursday. And we do top DFS plays every Saturday. We live stream on Sunday. Check me out on patreon.com slash BDGE if you want to support your boy and if you want exclusive access to my content, baby. Otherwise, I will see you all uh, in a couple days. Peace.